My name is Carrie Dietzik and I represent Senate District 60, which is Northeast Minneapolis, Southeast Minneapolis and Cedar Riverside. Um, I was first elected in a special election in January 2012. I'm State Senator Mary Kunish. I represent District 39, which are the communities of St. Anthony Village, New Brighton, Columbia Heights and Hilltop, Fridley and Spring Lake Park and I am in my fourth year in the Senate. So I am Elise Mann, I represent Senate District 50, and this is my second year in the Senate in my first term. My name is Jen McEwen, and I serve Dist Senate District 8, which is almost all of the city of Duluth, so it's, it's Duluth, essentially. And I've served now uh, for three years, and we're just, just into the fourth year. I ran for office because I was a teacher at the time and saw so many of the issues that affect our state are affecting our students and our teachers and the community. And I felt that after 25 years, I had a pretty good handle on what was uh, going on in our communities and uh, wanted to be able to help with some of the decision making and uh, funding opportunities so that our, all of our communities can really thrive. So I was never involved in politics um, and I was, I'm a physician and I noticed day after day that my patients were not getting the care that they needed. So I would uh, ask someone to go pick up their prescription, their inhaler, their insulin, whatever it was. And they would call me from the pharmacy and say, I can't, I can't afford it. Insurance won't cover it. Um, I would order scans or I would order tests or physical therapy. And again, Dr. Mann, I can't do it. Insurance won't cover it. I can't afford it. And so this was my day-to-day -day life where I'm trying to help someone be the best that they can be, be as healthy as they can be, work while working in a system that is preventing that from happening, right? Putting barriers upon barriers in front of patients. And I'm watching people suffer and I'm watching people um, struggle every single day. And so I thought there has to be something else that I can do. And so I decided to run for office. The former Senator Foga Miller had been there for a long time and he was appointed to the commissioner of higher ed. And so um, we all assumed that the house member was gonna run for the Senate seat. And so didn't think nothing of it. And then when she said she wasn't gonna run, I had a bunch of people call me to run and I you know, first said no. And then uh, one of my friends said, you know, you come up with creative ideas. You've been in and out of government and public private sector. Um, for a number of years, you know, you should take this opportunity because you can bring people together and get things done. Um, and if you don't do this, then you can't bitch. So that kind of was like, okay, it kind of got me thinking. So then I, you know, went down and filed and then never looked back. Yeah. Um, so I had been part of a group of community members in Duluth who had been working on um, clean water issues and in particular sulfide mining, the threat of sulfide mining to our community up in Duluth and up in the Northland. And um, I actually had no interest of in being in politics or elected office um, and was busy practicing law as an attorney. I was um, doing disability law at that time. And um, but out of that work with community members it became very apparent that my predecessor um, wasn't very responsive. It was the week before we had to let the Democratic local Democratic Party leadership know if anybody was going to challenge um, him for the endorsement, for the DFL endorsement. And I don't know, everything just came together that week where I talked to people who might be potential people who would be on a campaign team and they were ready to go and wanting to do it. And so I jumped on in and then the rest is the last three years. <laughs> it was kind of amazing. I wasn't expecting it to be as successful as it was, honestly. I thought it would be a harder fight than it was, but I won resoundingly. Um, I think certainly we've noticed more women running for office. We've noticed more people of color running for office. We've noticed that slowly but surely this place, right, this legislature is becoming uh, or starting to look more like Minnesota. Um, so I, I have noticed that in just a very short amount of time that I've been here. 
I've seen our caucus change in ways that I think are really positive. When I came into the Senate, it, it definitely had more of a feel of a, a kind of country club mentality. Um, and in some ways it still does. And I feel I'm not at home in that sort of environment. So it's a little bit awkward sometimes. But, um, but as the years have passed, we've had a lot of new people come into the Senate with a lot of, and into our caucus especially, with I think sort of a fresh approach to governing, like governing from uh, in collaboration with uh, their constituents, in collaboration with different um, groups of organizers and people coming together trying to affect change. So it just gives the, our caucus, a, I think, a healthier, better feel than it did when I came in. Well, my first year in the Sen Senate was uh, COVID years. So uh, there were very few senators around and we were spaced all over on the um, Senate floor. And so it was hard to build relationships, you know, when you don't even know who the other senators are or you haven't um, met them, you don't know what their priorities are. So the first two years were a little bit hard trying to, you know, build um, build a consensus around a lot of different pieces of legislation. Um, but things have changed since then. And now that we're back in full force, it's really great to see people, be able to stop them in the hallway and talk, and then build those relationships that are so important in the legislature. There's a lot of bills that are, you know, 66 to nothing, 67 to nothing. Um, they're just not the high profile issues. And so, you know, there was then, and I think there still is now a lot that is just, um, we all agree on and it's good for our constituents. Um, I think the, you know, debate at times, um, you know, for the most part, we stay very civil. Um, and then we actually have to get stuff done. Like in Congress, they just pass continuing resolutions where we actually have to get things done. So we are forced to work together to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. In general, I think that um, Minnesota has become more polarized and, and kind of dig their, their uh, heels in on certain issues and usually they're very local issues. And uh, I would like to see that, you know, become more of, a, of a, a, an opportunity for us to get to know each other and say, I feel this way because of where I live and the situations that we're in. And I'm hoping that we all will listen to that. For women issues, I think uh, we have moved the, um, the, the stone way ahead of where we started. We have codified reproductive rights. We have more investments in um, economic development for women. We have more legislation that protect uh, women, against, women and children and families against violence, especially domestic violence. You know, I've been in Minnesota since 1988. I came here as an immigrant. I didn't know how to speak English. Um, and I felt like back then my story was very unique. Right, I, me and my brother were the only English learner kids in school. Um, maybe there was one more, uh, but, but our story was very much, we were, we were the immigrant kids. Um, now, I feel like we are a state of immigrants. Minnesota has evolved immensely in that way. Um, and I think it's amazing, right? It's incredible to, to know that my class was, I think we had one Asian child in the class and everybody else is white. Uh, my kids' class is majority kids of color. So I think as far as the world changing and Minnesota changing with it, we are, we are doing that. We are changing, we are looking like the rest of the world and I think that's amazing. We are learning from each other, we're becoming richer because of that, right? Um, and then as far as women rights, I think we didn't have to fight in the past, right? We had some protections that were there as far as reproductive rights, certainly. Um, and that was all of a sudden taken away from us, right? Where our rights, our kids' rights are less than our own. And so to see people stand up against that and fight for that has been amazing. Well, I think since the Dobbs decision, we're definitely more aware of um, 
freedoms being taken away and rights being taken away. So I think definitely since the Dobbs decisions, we've just, that has been very much in the forefront and um, working to protect those freedoms. Um, the shift in the weather so that our winters are not as cold and not as cold at night and um, the summers being much hotter than they used to be uh, ever than I recall. In Duluth growing up, we sort of prided ourselves on we, we don't have uh, air conditioning. We don't need air conditioning. Like we're the air conditioned city. Naturally, we just are because of the lake. And that remains true some of the time, but more and more you, you have times and periods during the summertime, even in Duluth, right on Lake Superior, which is this brutally cold lake um, where people are seeking air conditioning. They kind of need it because it's just too hot. And so the the rapidness of the change that we've seen in our environment during the course of my lifetime here in Minnesota is really alarming to me. I feel like I see it all the time. I feel like we see it this winter where we didn't even have a winter. And the alarming part for me is that everybody just sort of goes along like it's everything's normal or it's just a sort of little phenomenon that we're dealing with. But it's it actually has catastrophic consequences and it will especially in our region for Minnesota. I, um, so I think, I don't know, I feel like I, I grew up in this very like cold Northern state that was very unique. And now Minnesota feels more and more like Arkansas. I never wanted to live in Arkansas. I wanted to live in the North. I love living in the North. I love the North. I love the Northern forests. I love the Northern cold lakes. I love this place. And to see it changing into something that it was never set out to be is really heartbreaking. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that in some ways things haven't changed a lot in terms of women's rights in Minnesota. I, I, I guess I, I was raised up in a family in Minnesota of a pro-choice family, family that valued people's autonomy to make decisions about their own body in regard to all sorts of things, including reproductive health and, and decisions. And, and um, I don't know, I think that we've, in some ways, because of the change that has happened, the organized political shift to the right in the United States, that the Minnesota is at least sort of, in some ways, kind of tried to hold strong to what I grew up with in Minnesota, <laughs> in some ways and hopefully sort of expanded our understanding over the course of the decades too with the marriage amendment um, and marriage equality and just I think people have grown. I know people in my own family have grown in their understanding and acceptance of and, and embracing, not just acceptance, but embracing of all of the differences that exist. Oh, I probably have a few over that 10 year time period. Um, th uh, this year, since I've been re-diagnosed with cancer, um, you know, this whole journey has taught me a lot of things of what, um, you know, patients have had to deal with. And so having wigs covered, um, I think is a bill that I'm proud of and hopefully we can get through. I know Congress has a bill to make it durable medical equipment, which would then cover it under the um, the ACA. but you know, until then. Um, also looking at, you know, we have a bill this year on medical debt, which I think is good, but how do you get um, people to not have that debt? So like when I got my $100,000 bill, you know, I was able to read it and then call the insurance company and, you know, have a discussion with them where a lot of people will just shut down and then all of a sudden they have that debt. So trying to figure out how do we, um, you know, how do we help patients? to be able to, you know, they have enough that they're dealing with and how do we help them deal with, um, to make them less barriers for them to get the help and treatment that they need. My biggest uh, accomplishment, of course, was our education finance bill last year. As the chair of education finance, I was thrilled to be able to have the responsibility and the opportunity to put dollars into the schools where we felt were going to be um, the best and have the, the best impact. And so that five point $5 billion bill that started with um, our very earliest learners, went all the way through adult ed and community ed, 
filling in those buckets that hadn't been touched in years uh, is really one of my biggest accomplishments, as well as the investment in libraries. Uh, and we're seeing, we're seeing positive uh, effects from that al al already. Um, and so that, that makes me extremely, extremely proud. One bill that I'm most proud of, uh, of course, was to create the Office of the Missing and Mur Murdered Indigenous Relatives that we've created. It's the first in the nation. Uh, and then be able to, uh, again, find ways to support that office. So we've created a reward fund uh, for uh, folks to be able to share the information on those that have gone before us, but also uh, created that license plate, that um, MMIR specialty license plate, so that not only is it being visual, those dollars will also go into that reward fund and we'll continue the work um, to address those issues, the historic trauma in our indigenous community. One of the biggest accomplishments was the Protect Reproductive Options Act last year. I sort of um, was just lucky to have fallen into the role of being the lead author on that bill. It was something that I took up when we were in the minority. And um, I, I think it just speaks to, I am the sort of legislator who wants to see good legislation introduced, talked about, moved if at all possible, and passed if at all possible. So even when we were in the minority and I was approached and there was no chance we were going to pass the Protect Reproductive Options Act at that time, I said, heck yes, let's do this. Yeah, so I think my biggest accomplishment and my favorite piece of legislation are the same, and that is paid, paid leave. Um, you know, we are the only country in the world who believes that when you have a baby, you should get back to work within two weeks. Um, we are the only country in the world who believes that if you fall and break your hip, you should get back to work as soon as you can. And if you can't work, then you're out of luck. I don't understand how we treat people this way. I don't. It's as if people are not people in America, right? We are robots and we are here for the singular purpose of making money, period. That's it. Um, we forget that we have lives and we forget our humanity. Um, and so to be able to bring this piece of legislation to Minnesota that says, we see you as a person, as a whole person, and we understand that you're gonna get sick, and we understand that your family might get sick and need care, and we understand the importance of bonding with a new baby and of keeping families together. We understand that, and so we're gonna help you do that. And we're gonna join the rest of the world who has been doing this for decades upon decades. Um, so that has been something that I've been very passionate about, that I'm extremely excited that we passed last year, um, and, and I can't wait to see the wonderful things that come out of it. Oh, there were a lot of women um, that, you know, just said, put your head down and do your work. You know, you might get frustrated with people, but just keep your head down and do your work and um, do your work for your constituents. And then, you know, everything else will fall in place. So mm -hmm. listen to your constituents and um, stay in contact with them. You know, I guess I look to, I look to some of our seasoned um, legislators like Sandy Pappas and Ann Rest, um, Aaron Murphy. I served with Aaron Murphy in the House. These are women that have been doing this work for decades, absolute decades. But then we look at some of our newer members and they're bringing in fresh ideas and they're bringing in boots on the ground, grassroots issues in their own communities. So while I wouldn't say that there's one person, I look to I look to our entire caucus as inspiration because they re reflect and they represent the diversity of our state. And that's really what we want to do is, is look at that diversity and make sure that everybody's got the same opportunity to, to have a happy, healthy life. I think as far as inspiration, certainly every woman who's come before me, right? Um, we have Rena Moran, we have Lori Halverson, we have Ruth Richardson, we have, she came at the same time as me, but we have Ann Rust and Sandy Pappas who have been here and have been in this space, which is difficult, it's a difficult space for women. Um, so these people that have been here and doing the work and making room so that the rest of us can come and be in this space, I think 
knowing how hard it is for me to be in this space, they are all huge inspirations to me. There have been people in the Senate who have been really, and many people, many colleagues who have been very kind and very helpful about helping me learn how things are, how things work here in the Senate and how to, how to move bills. Um, but I, I really have found a lot of my inspiration and help through my staff that I've had. Um, Fabian Bean, who is the committee administrator for labor, does tremendous work here in the Senate and, and is um, just such a great friend and colleague. And also um, my team in Duluth. I, my first two years especially, I made a point to regularly meet with them and I've been missing them. I think everybody's really busy right now doing lots of things, but, um, but just checking in with all of, the, all of my friends and people in Duluth who are doing really important political work. Yeah, I think my career outside of this place affects definitely everything I do in this space, right? Again, it's the reason I'm here is because of the stories I hear in my day-to-day -day job. Um, and for me, you know, I became a doctor in the first place because I wanted to, you know, that the old cliche, I just want to help people. But that's really all it is, right? I want to sit in a room, I want you to tell me what's wrong, and I want to help you. Um, so to bring that to a bigger scale and sit in a room full of people and have them say this is what's this is what makes my life hard. And for me to say, we can potentially fix that. That's been really incredible. My biggest challenge has probably been time. Uh, we just don't have enough of it, even though uh, uh, we have these few months to get our work done. There's so many conversations to be had. There's so many places to visit in Minnesota to understand why the need is there. Um, and, uh, you know, just this morning, texting and talking and interviewing all at the same time. Uh, time is really a challenge, and we have a very short t amount of time to get a lot of work done. Um, but it's exciting, it's exhilarating, and you know, after you look at what we were able to do in, again, just a few short months last year, um, we have to make sure we're using our time in the best way, and I think we're doing a good job of it. And I offered a lot of bills over the years, and so I'd have to go back and look at them. But again, I think it's just staying in touch with your um, constituents and um, you know, and being open and talking to people and not being afraid to call somebody up. Um, and talk to, you know, the opposing side of a bill to find out like, you know, you know, what are your issues with the bill and not just in general, but specifically, you know, give me line items that you think would change. Um, and then when I like had a bill calling up like, you know, either the city or the county um, or business leaders um, or community leaders to find out, you know, what do you like about this bill? What do you not like about the bill? And again, not just in general, but specific language in the bill so that, you know, we try to limit unintended consequences. Go for it. Jump in, talk to people, talk to your neighbors, show up at Precinct Caucus. Um, you know, if there's a candidate that you really want to support, go out there, learn the issues, door knock, talk to people. Um, and then if you want to run, again, I think it's helpful to um, Talk to your neighbors, learn the issues that are concerning concerning to them, and um, go for it. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved in politics, I would say get to know your community and your community members really well. Understand the issues that are local, but then reach out to other legislators or other political folks that you know around Minnesota to understand what are the struggles that are, are different than yours? Because when you become a legislator, you are representing all of Minnesota as well as your own community. For anyone who wants to get into politics, I say do it. Because if you, is this something you really wanna do? Um, it's because you're likely you're seeing a deficit somewhere that you want to fix. Um, and the more people from the more backgrounds we can get, from more lived experience that we can get into this space, the better our policies will be, the better our laws will be to encompass everyone. So I encourage everyone to run. Yeah, I would, I would encourage people to sort of look inward and think about the reasons why they're wanting to do that. Um, 
and and then also connects with people in their community who are already doing some of the some of the things toward making the changes that they think that they'd like to see. This session, um, I'm excited to create and be part of building more good policy for education and then you know whatever funds we have available putting it towards uh, making sure that we are continuing to invest in our in our schools and our, our education um, i'm determined to get the era amendment passed i was able to pass it in the house uh, we passed it off the senate floor last year and it might come back from the house a little bit different but we'll continue to work on um, that Equal Rights Amendment. And then um, just looking at how I can improve the life in my own district, maybe with some bonding bills and some of the other issues that, that we have going on in the environment. I'm just a regular person. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I feel like when you're in elected office that it, one of the most jarring things is that you start to see that people form these opinions of who you are and it can be positive or negative but they think they sort of know you who you are based on political stances that you take or maybe speeches that you've given or where they've seen you out in the public but it's I don't know sometimes I meet with constituents and it's almost like they don't realize that I, I literally like live down the street from them they think that maybe I'm, they start viewing me and I, I, I imagine, I, it is sort of how I view like Amy Klobuchar or Tina Smith or something. They're sort of like these really fancy people who are out there doing fancy things and I don't really know who, how their lives are or how their routines go and what they're like. But I don't know, when your state legislators, I guess it depends on kind of the economic status, but I'm married to a public school teacher, so we don't live in any kind of fancy house. We are just regular people, just like anybody else in the community, dealing with all the same kind of things that people in the community are dealing with. No, it's been um, awesome. I tell people we have such a great state and there's so much going on in this state that going to the Senate, you learn something every day in committees and on the floor, you learn something um, that the state is doing, that the state is working on, that the colleges are working on, the research we're doing in the state. Um, you just learn something every single day about how great this state is and the people that live in it. 